welcome once more to Vulture's Rainbow Theatre. I am your host, Damon Vulture. Tonight, you'll be hearing a story written and read by my esteemed colleague, Anan Imo. Join me now as we enjoy Anan's dark, supernatural tale of East Texas. Walking Fish In my part of East Texas, way out in the nether regions of Huff County, you're going to find piney woods, red dirt roads leading to places you got no business being, and folks who want to be left the hell alone. That's why they're out there. You mind your own damn business and they'll mind theirs. I'm one of those folks. I'm retired now and don't have to kiss hind end to keep my pension. Got me a double wide with a septic tank and city water since I ain't that far out from Apache Mounds. That's the little town on the farm to market road you turn off of to get on my red dirt road to nowhere. Thanks to Apache Mounds, I got electrical power too. There ain't much to the town, but it's good for some of the necessities of life. If I want beer and gas, they got it. If I want groceries or bullets, then it's a long drive over to Huff City. That's all right, though. There's a price to be paid for being left the hell alone. Now, my neighbor, Gil Farnham, He'd been living this lifestyle for a lot longer time than I have. Just like me, he wasn't exactly off the grid, but he was drifting that way. I expected sooner or later he might just up and disappear. That's probably one of the reasons why I checked on him now and again. The other reason, I guess, is that him and me had some shared experiences and interests. Neither of us liked anybody's company much, but we could stand each other enough to be on a first-name basis and talk about the weather. My wife was took by cancer some years ago, and Gills, well, she was in some kind of a horrible freak accident. You'll find out more about that from me later on died suddenly and left Gil floating down the river of his life in a canoe without oars. I heard about the accident over in that crappy little convenience store in Apache Mounds. When I realized that old boy lived just a quarter mile down from me, I, I thought I'd look in on him. You know, one widower commiserating with another. We hit it off pretty well, actually. But first, let me tell you about where he lived. His house was a broke-down old pier and beam ranch-style house, the kind they used to build back in the day. The wooden siding didn't just need paint. It was rotten in a lot of places. The roof hadn't been replaced since Nixon was president. In fact, part of it was covered with a blue tarp that was turning black from fungus. Gutters full of pine needles and pieces of branch. The yard was littered with junk he would brought back from various places in case he could use or sell any of it. Weeds grew anywhere there wasn't a tire rim or an old bicycle or a car door from a Plymouth Fury. First time I knocked on the screen door, he didn't come to it and invite me in. A voice shouted something like, Door ain't hooked. I'm in the back. First thing I noticed when I come in the door was the smell of cat urine. There were live cats to go with the smell, two or three that I could see. Several others I figured were hiding or taking a crap under a bed or a saggy couch somewhere. Living room was a holy mess. Lazy boy chair from the 80s and a Scratched up end table piled with dog-eared crossword books 
and an assortment of beer cans, some crumpled and empty, some half full. Ashtray so full of butts, I could hardly, I could actually smell it across the room, through the cat pee. Floor, covered with stacks of magazines and newspapers. On top of a big greasy rubber mat, he had a boat engine took apart and a metal box full of old wrenches and whatnot sitting on the floor nearby. Behind the living room was a door leading into the kitchen, where the counters were covered with dishes dirty and clean, empty orange juice cartons, and an empty fifth of vodka, which explained what the orange juice was for. On beyond the stank and craziness of the kitchen was some kind of a sitting room, it had a sliding glass door leading to outside, but the door was covered by tightly shut curtains. In front of the curtains was a brand new high-def TV, the glow from it being the only light in that setting room. Across from the TV was a couch on which sat a basket of laundry and a good old boy next to it with a cannonball for a belly. Wore a Texas Rangers ball cap with a frayed brim, and sported a short white beard. He never turned to look at me, but kept his eyes locked on the screen. He was mesmerized by some kind of infomercial about pillows, which he gazed on with a fascination I'd have reserved for an episode of The Deadliest Catch, or maybe a tied baseball game at the bottom of the ninth. Beer's in the fridge, he said, eyes still fixed on the glow of the TV. If you're teetotaling, there's a pitcher of iced tea. Wash yourself a glass. Sounded good to me. I found a shiner bock and came back to sit in the folding camp chair. I keep hoping they'll get back to the news, he said. But this pillow guy's got to finish preaching first. And that's how we met. Once he turned off the TV, we got to talking, found some things in common, and after a while, and a few visits, we sort of become friends. He liked that I'd show up at the house with a six-pack of Shiner or sometimes even another fifth of his favorite poison. I noticed on my umpty-umpt visit that the boat engine wasn't took apart on the living room rug anymore and he invited me to go out with him on his bass boat, which was now operational. That boat was in better shape than anything else he owned, and we spent a whole day trolling up and down the Huff River pulling in bass. We filleted them and dipped them in egg batter and fried them. Bass sliced fresh tomatoes from a guy selling them out of his truck farm and beer. That was dinner back at his house. Fit for a king, wouldn't you say? His drinking bothered me some. I mean, I don't mind tying one on myself every once in a while, especially if I get morose and moody about my late wife, Glorietta. But Gil, he drank day and night. Beer, while he did his puzzles and socialized, vodka and orange juice when no one was there. You could smell it on his breath, and you could smell it coming out of his pores, that sweet aqua velva type smell with a tinge of fruit in it. If he coughed into a handkerchief and stuffed it into a bottle, you'd have had you a right smart Molotov cocktail. I ain't lying. One day while I'm over there, the two of us watching one of those UFO shows on the History Channel, he turns to me and says, You want to know why I drank so much? I nodded and kept my mouth zipped. He was opening up a door into his life that had so far remained closed, and I didn't want to push it back shut with the wrong words. Well, I'm going to tell you. Hope you got some time, because this story's going to take a while. I shrugged and said, go ahead, my social schedule's open for the evening. He muted the TV but did not turn it off, didn't make eye contact with me either. 
The reflection of a yogurt commercial danced and flickered on his irises. There's some things you got to know about my wife, Linda Jean. She was the best woman that ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. I didn't deserve a woman like that. She worked hard and kept us afloat when I got laid off at the lumber yard after putting my back out. I got disability checks, but they weren't enough. So she worked two jobs, night clerk at a motel outside Huff City, and afternoons keeping the books at Potts and Hemsworth, that old clothing store in downtown. You know, it finally closed after the Walmart opened on Highway 41. I knew for sure that Walmart had closed up the whole downtown since they offered everything from car batteries to tools to shoes to haircuts, open 24 hours a day. No one could beat competition like that. Once I got hired on as a trucker, she quit her old job at the motel but stayed with Potts and Hemsworth until they shut down. This would have been somewhere around 97 or 98, I guess. She had to look for a new job after that, so what do you know, Walmart? It brought home the bacon and there wasn't nothing else. Now sometime around then with changes going on in her work, she started looking for some kind of a fresh start in her spiritual life. Told me she'd been on the internet and seen something which arrested her attention mightily. I wasn't much involved in the internet myself back then. Mainly, I only used it late at night sometimes to look at porn or get into political arguments and chat rooms. But she said she was getting interested in witchcraft. Well, you know, like everybody else around here, I was raised a hard-shell Baptist, so I tried to talk her out of it. I mean, I had visions of finding the devil in our closet or waking up in the middle of the night to see her scuttling across the ceiling, telling me what my mama was fixing to do in hell. She said it wasn't nothing like that. Wasn't nothing about the devil or human sacrifices or trafficking with demons. Said it was about the sacred earth and meeting the gods of nature. Sounded kind of like engine stuff to me, which made me feel better. My great-grandma was Cherokee, after all, and I never heard no stories about her worshiping the devil. So I just said, okay, but watch yourself. I'd like to say she learned her witching from some old conjure woman back in the Piney Woods, but the truth is... Everything she learned to do in practice come right from that desktop computer in our old guest room. She got good at her craft, too. Learned to read palms and tarot cards. Did spells to help people. They worked, too. Many's a family she conjured for that was seen through hard times and on out the other side. Once, when it had been raining for three straight weeks and we needed to visit her sick mama in Huff City, she called to her gods for a break so we could get through that stretch where it floods real bad on Highway 41. Sunshine all day long that day, and the moment we pulled back into the carport that night, the deluge went on just like it had never stopped. Folks started coming to her for help as she got more and more sure of her power. I told her she should start charging, but she never would take money. She said there was no rule against it she could find, but it just didn't feel right for her. She was an angel, a real one, even if she was a witch. At some point, this would have been just a few years ago when her reputation was big in these parts, I noticed she began sewing these little cloth dolls. Nothing fancy. She'd cut a simple figure of a person out of scrap cloth and then trace and cut another one just like it. Then she would 
put them together and sew, stuffing the inside between them with cotton. She could make several of these in a single evening. I noticed she was keeping photos nearby her on the couch here in the sitting room where she worked, photos of folks who'd come to her for help, bringing her these family pictures to help her. She'd cut out and glue on these little crude clothes that looked like what they was wearing in the photos, and then she'd paint faces that didn't exactly look like the folks in the pictures, but you could tell who they were in a, a cartoony sort of way. I noticed that sometime when she was sticking cotton wadding in between the upper and lower layer of a doll, she'd put something from that person inside it, like some strands of hair or a ring they had owned and given her for the purpose, or maybe even just a pairing from one of their fingernails. She'd sew a little tag on each doll with the name of the person on it and then take it off to that spare room where the computer used to be. I say used to be because she'd moved it out into the living room. She turned that spare bedroom into her conjuring place. I mean, well, it's all still back there if you want to take a look. Bags and jars of herbs and powders. A big circle she'd painted on the floor which she'd stand inside to do her conjuring. Signs and symbols on the walls. Markings to show which way the directions of the world go. You know, east, south, west, and north. You can see her altar back there with its little statue of a big, round, naked woman, and next to her, some fellow with hairy legs and deer horns. She swore up and down it wasn't the devil, and I believe her. I mean, the way she blessed folks with her prayers and fortune-telling, there just wasn't no devil in it. She said the naked lady was the mother of everything in the world that is. From her all things come, and all things is going back to her in the end. That's what she used to say. The horned fella, she said, was the hunter god of the forest. I like that idea. Anybody who spends his time hunting in these piney woods, now that's someone I can understand. If God is a hunter in these woods and has him a short, round, little sweetheart at home, he's welcome at my campfire any day. If Linda Jean got excited with this witching thing, I found an obsession of my own. Ever since I can remember, there'd been stories that got told when a bunch of us would camp out on a stream feeding into Apache Lake. After we'd put out our trot lines for the night and set out a can of dog food underwater upstream to attract crappies for some late night fishing, we'd have a little campfire or just maybe turn up a kerosene lamp and tell stories. One of these stories was about the walking fish. You ever heard of it? They say that even way back when the Caddo Indians lived here, they told stories about this thing. Supposedly, there's this fish in Apache Lake that's been there for hundreds of years, maybe thousands, growing bigger all the time. Now, maybe you've heard of catfish that's got nearly as big as a car, and I've seen one of them with my own eyes, but this thing, the walking fish, it ain't no catfish. I'd been hearing since I was a little kid that this sucker is some kind of thing that goes back, back maybe all the way to the Stone Age. It's supposed to be the size of a school bus, and it's also supposed to be able to drag itself out of the water and pull itself along the shore on its two front fins. These stories were fun to hear, even if we didn't really believe them all the way, and I can remember as a teenager sitting on the bank where we'd camped, sitting there after all the lights was doused, just sitting and listening, you know, to see if I could hear something big swimming around out there, or maybe even dragging its big-ass self through the mud. I can remember a couple of times when armadillos, you know the kind of racket they make foraging around for bugs, just about scared me right out of my pants. But you grow beyond things after a while. Nothing ever happens and you get to be an old fart like me. 
You don't even think about those stories anymore. Not even on a john boat in the middle of the night when you've caught all the crappie you can eat and have doused the lamp for a few minutes to have a smoke and look at the stars. But when Linda Jean got good at her witching and I seen how there really was magic in the world, I got to thinking. If there are gods and magic, maybe there really is a giant fish out there in that lake. The idea began to grow on me of hunting that thing down. Not to catch it, mind you. I mean, how the hell would you do that? What I wanted was to see it, to get a good look at the thing, to satisfy curiosity. I talked to Linda Jean about it. She was a wise woman with Linda Jean, and I wanted to hear her thoughts about my little project before I got into it deep. Let me tell you, that was one of those conversations that folks get into sometimes where it seems like a door gets opened in time and space, and you get one of those little glimpses into stuff you ain't normally allowed to look at. Gil, she said to me, this fish, if it's real, can't be no ordinary critter. I mean, think about it. If it's as old as folks says it is, it's got beyond being a living thing to become something else. I must have looked pretty clueless because our eyes met and she could see I wasn't following her. You know, Gil, the big world, the universe, it's got all kind of forces moving through it. Most of those forces we can't see and can't keep track of them. But sometimes if someone is listening just right, if someone is in just the right frame of mind, then one of them forces can make itself known in a special way. Sometimes it's a, it's a vision that comes in a dream. Like when Jacob dreamed he saw a ladder going up to God with angels climbing around on it. Sometimes it's something solid and real. Like when Moses saw a burning bush out on Mount Sinai and a voice came out of it. Sometimes people see ghosts or gods. And sometimes they see critters. You remember that poem we had to learn in high school about the raven? Guy in the poem sees this bird walking around inside his house and thinks the bird is talking to him, telling him, nevermore. I think that bird was one of those forces in the world, taking on a form that writer could understand and see. I think he saw time, and he knew its other name is death. Are you telling me that walking fish out there might be some kind of force in the universe, I asked, wanting to make sure I understood? Could be, she said. And that's why I'm going to tell you to watch yourself with this thing, she went on. Maybe there ain't no harm in calling this thing up and looking at it. People go to see curious things all the time. But if you get close to a rattlesnake to make out his scales, don't be surprised if you end up with a fang in your foot. And if you sweet talk this fish out onto the mud, you get may get more than you asked for. That conversation should have made me back off, but it actually did the opposite. My pump was primed, and I was more curious than ever. I started thinking and studying how I was going to get my glimpse of the walking fish, my mind so fixed on the idea that I couldn't think about nothing else much. Meantime, Linda Jean was making her dolls, called them poppets, and said they were a new way they'd found of putting blessings on people. Someone needed healing, she'd make a poppet doll of them and conjure over it. Someone needed a new job, the same. She'd wrap that dolly in money and sang over it till whoever it was had the job they'd been wishing for. One day we'd driven over in the pickup truck to Huff City to visit Linda Jean's mama, and it was late in the afternoon. Coming through downtown, we caught sight of the old Potts and Hemsworth building sitting there empty with its dusty windows and beams of 
afternoon light throwing yellow lines across the empty walls and tile floors of the old place. Linda Jean told me to stop a minute and back up and drive down the alley to the service entrance around back. She had me park back there and dug around in her purse till she come out with a key, a store key she still had. She said, I've got me a crazy idea just like you. Come on. I turned off the truck and followed her to a back door by the service bay. The key got us in and we found ourselves inside the musty, empty ground floor of the old clothing shop in its old backwoods area which customers never saw. A couple of high windows gave us enough light to see. There was a door with an old civil defense sign on it and the words bomb shelter. Back when we was kids, they used to do this, you know. The government was worried about nuclear war and they'd find big basements in a town and then stick a sign on the door saying it was now a bomb shelter in case the Russians went to war with us and folks needed a place to hide. Key worked on that door too showing us a flight of steel stairs going down into the dark. We didn't have no flashlight, but we did have our cell phones, so we used those to find our way down to the floor of that basement. I saw something down there that scared the life out of me at first. It was the store mannequins, some of them standing up looking our direction, some of them lying on the floor, arms akimbo, eyes staring up at the dark ceiling like they must have done for years. All of them naked as jaybirds. What are we doing down here, I asked Linda Jean. She said, we're picking us out some poppets. I was kind of stunned. You gonna use those like you use them dolls back at the house? Yep, she said. The bigger the poppet, the bigger the blessings I can conjure. That's what I think anyway. We hauled three or four mannequins out of there that afternoon, throwing them in the back of the truck, and I had a tarp we could pull over them so as not to excite curiosity. When we got back to the house with them, she just laid them out on the back porch and said, that would do for now. Months went by, and she and I got involved in our separate projects. When she was at Walmart working, I'd put my bass boat in the river and follow the current out into Apache Lake, looking for likely spots, places that seemed like the walking fish might go. It come to me that if this was really a force or some kind of spirit in a giant fish's body, I might should look for a place with a special feeling around it. You know, not just deep water where it'd be able to swim being so big and all, but where there was also a kind of, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A kind of haunted feeling around it. I tried some places, but no dice. It was Linda Jean that solved the problem for me. Linda Jean had started working with those mannequins, dressing them up in clothes she got from the people who asked her to bless them, conjuring over them in her witch room. There was one woman with no money to speak of and nary a pot to piss in who won the lottery because of Linda Jean. She done me too, dressing up one of those mannequins in my clothes, praying over my back which had never got fixed right since I injured it, and damn if my spine didn't come out stronger than it had been when I was 19 years old. One night over dinner when I was in a good mood, Linda Jean put her hand on mine there at the table, looking kind of sheepish, and she caught my eye. I'm real embarrassed about this, she said. I should have thought this through when I started using them mannequins. You're doing a lot of good, Linda Jean, I told her. Ain't nothing wrong with what you done with them mannequins, except maybe the fact that we're stealing them. No one's ever going to miss them, she said, but that ain't the problem. The problem is when you make a poppet like the ones I'm making, 
once you charge them up with a spell, you got to keep them in a safe place where they can't be touched or acted on by someone else up to no good. I got a drawer full of them little dolls wrapped up real nice, kept in a safe place where they can keep working without being bothered. But what am I going to do with these mannequins? Ain't no place to keep them like that around here. Well, I saw her point. I mean, I suppose we could have put them out in the yard with the other junk, but someone could bother them there if they had a notion. And besides that, I sell that junk to folks who have a use for it. Did I want to be telling folks every time they come by? No, Linda Jean says them mannequins ain't for sale. Besides which, they looked creepy enough when we stood them out out there on the porch or when they was leaning against a bookcase in the hall waiting for Linda Jean to conjure them. A crowd of those plastic folks out there in the front yard might just drive off my junk business clientele. So anyway, I did some studying on the problem and come up with a solution. You know how down at the end of this dirt road it just sloops down to the Apache River Bank? You remember we put the bass boat in down there last week, remember? Anyway, well, I said, what if I take them mannequins downstream to the lake? You know that old barn out there in the woods, the one you can just barely see the roof of when you're fishing along that bank? I've checked it out. The easement's all grown up with weeds and stubby little pines. Ain't nobody been out there for probably 20 years except me. We could put the mannequins inside that barn and slide the door shut. They'd be as safe as they would anywhere, I said. So that's what I done with them. Linda Jean made sure they was tagged with their names and wrapped in plastic so rain leaking through that old barn roof wouldn't ruin them. I'd load a few mannequins in the bass boat every other week or so and pull it on its trailer down to the river. From there, it was a 20-minute trip downstream, tie up on the lake shore, and haul those big old poppets into the barn. Now, you remember I told you how it come to me that the walking fish needed a haunted place to attract him. How a place that felt like it was on the edge of what we know and what we don't might be the bait that'd bring him around. Well, I noticed something after bunches of trips out to store them mannequins. They was power on them, and power in them. And as we would get more of them from Potts and Hemsworth's basement, and Linda Jean would conjure over them, and I would haul them out to that old barn, it got to feeling right hinky around there. I mean, there was power not just in the barn with the poppets, I could feel it out there in the woods nearby and out in the water, too. It got to where I think I could have found that place in the dark without a cue beam just from the sense of it. I tell you, it wasn't evil out there, but it was goddamn spooky. And that's when it come to me. I realized where I needed to be waiting for my walking fish, a place like that barn. A supernatural power dressed up in the body of a giant fish. If it was going to stop by anywhere around Apache Lake, it'd be around where that barn was. That, I realized, was where I needed to be waiting for my chance to see this thing. I chose a spring night in April when it wasn't going to rain when I knew the stars and the full moon would be out, so if there was anything to see, I could see it. I went back and forth in my mind about whether to do my watching from the boat or from the shore, and decided I didn't want to chance that thing coming up under my bass boat like a whale, like in one of those pictures you see where the boat is broken up on the whale's back when he comes up and the sailors throw it out into the water. If my boat got wrecked, I'd have zero chance of swimming away from that thing. Whereas if I was on the shore and it hauled itself out on its walking fins, probably I could outrun it. Late that afternoon, I got Linda Jean to drive me down to the water in the pickup with the plastic John boat and a sleeping bag. The barn would be my tent if I needed to sleep. 
I'd be using a trolling motor instead of my outboard to move the boat downstream, so the trip would take a little longer, but it, I didn't want my to get my bass boat mixed up with this lake monster. That thing cost me a ton of money to buy and keep up, whereas the John boat I won in a poker game, and if it got et by the walking fish, I wouldn't be out anything. Night come and the stars come out. Then the moon started climbing into the sky. First sign of it was the pine trees in the east going all silver near their tops. And then there it was, shining in the sky low over the piney woods. The full moon sending out a long beam across the water where the light broke it up into flickers and flashes. You could hear about 47 different kinds of frogs and toads making their noises, some chirping like birds, some letting out long, low, bellering calls, almost like the calls that cows make when they think you're about to feed them something. I'm sitting there on the lake shore listening to all of this, plus the crashing racket of armadillos back behind me in the shadows of the woods, nosing through dead leaves and old rotten branches to get at the bugs they wanted for supper. Over and through all of that, the crickets, their chirps setting up a rhythm behind all the other random noises. I wondered just how I would hear any disturbance on the water if the walking fish came swimming up from out of the deep. But the moon promised me that if they was a giant fish, I was sure as hell gonna see it. And see it I did. Round about 11.30 my eyes are drooping. And I'm thinking, oh the heck with this. The thought of my sleeping bag, even if it was surrounded in the barn by charged up magic mannequins, sounded mighty comfy. Then come this sound, like something big swishing around out there in the lake close by. At first, I thought maybe I was hearing oars from somebody's kayak, but then I see it out there on the lake, there in the moonlight, this kind of big ripple like a single wave from the wake of a boat speeding by. This ripple which rolls across the lake until it hits the shore right where I am. And then I see something black pop out of the water way out there, high in the middle but rolling down into the water front and back like the long profile of a submarine. About the same size as one, two, Except instead of a conning tower, it's got this nasty looking fin, like a wahoo or a marlin on steroids. I won't even repeat what I said under my breath. Then I'm lifting up on hands and shoes, spider walking back away from the water, my eyes still on the thing as it wanders back and forth, clear as day with its black silhouette against all that water sparkling with moonlight. This fish was a massive thing, and you'd have thought it would move sluggish-like through water, but it didn't. Its motions were fast, and it turned on a dime. It's coming toward the shore, pulled in my direction, I guess, by the magic it feels, coming from that barn. And now I've spider-walked up against the tree, and I use it to get myself back to standing. I want to see it, but not too close, so I'm backing up now into the shadows of the trees, watching the tapering shape of that fish as it swims right to the bank. I find cover in a bunch of undergrowth. I'm praying it ain't poison ivy or a berry bush loaded with deer ticks, but that's a problem for later. I'm in a place I can watch maybe without being seen. It didn't just nose to shore and start flopping onto the mud like a seal. The front end of it lifted up on stout fins, and with those fins it dragged itself forward with speed until the back fins kicked in. Now it was up on all fours, moving along like a hungry elephant looking for food, and let me tell you, it was huge and heavy. When it dragged against a pine, the rough scales of it caught that tree and tore a chunk out of the bark. And right after that, it sort of lost its balance for a moment, swerving to the side where it hit another tree, a young tree, and knocked it right over, even though 
it had been rooted in the ground. The thing was clumsy on land, even if it was fast, and part of the problem, I think, was that its eyes were on the sides of its head, so it couldn't see what was directly in front of it. It stopped for a moment, maybe to get its bearings, and then that head bent some. An eye the size of a tractor wheel caught sight of me, and it stiffened. Suddenly, it charged forward toward me like a Mack truck with my name and number on the front fender. It was then that I did something stupid. I thought it was smart at the time. That's about all I could say in my defense. I knew I couldn't outrun it, but if I could get into the barn, I believed, I could slide the door back into place and bar it shut. I'd seen the bar beam leaned up against the inside wall and the, the metal hooks on the doors were still strong. I ran and didn't look back, but I could hear that walking fish tearing up the path and cracking down trees on its way to get me. I made it to the barn and ran inside where it was dark. I slid the door shut, which made a racket and gave away my position immediately. I found the beam and got it slapped down into those hooks just before something whomped up against the doors, rattling both the frame of the structure and the teeth in my head. Now, we'd lean those store mannequins along the right-hand wall one after the other. The one closest to the door had a tag with my wife's name on it. Linda Jean had said she might need a poppet of herself someday if she had to do strong magic to help herself against something, and she wanted it where she could find it. The very last mannequins along the wall near the back wall of the barn were bagged together. The female one was still wearing the second-hand wedding outfit Linda Jean had found for it. The other in the bag, a male, was wearing a suit. A young lady had come to her in love with this young fella she wanted to marry, she said, and would Linda Jean do some conjuring so it would really happen? Linda Jean had dressed those two poppets up and done her dancing and singing around them, and then we bagged them up, being sure to tag them with their proper names. Now here they were at the end of the line of mannequins. And those two folks, they did get married. In fact, the night I was being chased around by this fish, they hadn't been married but about two or three weeks. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you about this, but you'll find out. There was another whomp on the doors, and then I could hear the hiss of its dragon body through the weeds around the barn. Now a whomp came from the wall where the mannequins was leaned up. I hadn't thought about it before, but now I remember that even if the doors was strong, there were weaknesses in the old weathered walls, places where light come through in the daytime, where boards had split and cracked. The next whomp was even stronger and several of the mannequins fell to the dirt floor of the barn. There was a rusty old Alice Chalmers tractor sitting in there back in the back, near the opposite corner of the barn where, from where Linda Jean's poppet was, so I tiptoed to uh, run back there, thinking to get behind that heavy piece of machinery. With its wide wheelbase, even if the fish got in there and hit it, I was thinking maybe it wouldn't tip over and I could hide behind it. Then the wall with the poppet split open and a big section of it there by the doors cracked loose and came down alongside the fish as the thing lunged forward in the dark toward me. I got to thinking the shadowy inside of that barn might could help me get away. The question was which way to go. There was an empty oil can near the tractor, which I could barely make out. I took it and threw it against the back wall of the barn for a distraction, where it must have hit something and knocked it over. Maybe there was a rake back there or something. Anyway, the racket caught the fish's attention and it swerved away from coming at the tractor and headed toward that back wall at full speed. It hit that back wall with force and busted right through, dragging itself back into the moonlight, and dragon caught in its fins that plastic bag with the two wedding mannequins in it. 
As it lumbered along the ground, the bag caught in one of the bottom fins, dragged along with it. I thought maybe this was a good time to try and get the thing back in the water, so I run out through the hole after it and crashed through the woods to see if I could beat it to the lake shore. My John boat was there, pulled up onto the mud, nothing in it but my truck battery and the trolling motor I put it in there to power. As the fish come out through the trees into the moonlight, I shoved that boat into the water, wading out with it, and locked the motor into position with its blades down in the drink. When I started it, the fish swerved in my direction, and with that, I shoved the boat out, the trolling motor spinning at top speed, which wasn't much. The John boat scuttled out slowly into the water, headed for the deep part of the lake, and I ran for the trees. Behind my back, there was a huge splash and the sound of splintering plastic. But I was deep in the pine shadows now and kept running down the overgrown easement that led from the barn out to a red dirt access road. When I got to the road, I run down it, knowing it hooked up with Highway 41. And when I got to 41, I run all the way home. When Linda Jean saw me this next morning, kind of dinged up, she asked, What happened last night? I told her about seeing the fish and how I lost the John boat to save my life. She wanted to hear more, but I told her I had to study on it, thank some about what I saw out there before I could talk more about any of it. I didn't say nothing about the barn, though, or about the mess that had been made out of the mannequins. I knew it'd make her upset, though I wasn't sure exactly why. In my mind, I was already planning how I was going to go back to the barn and clean up the mess, nail everything back together, and push them mannequins back up along the wall where they'd been before. In fact, when Sunday morning come, she was off from work and so was I, so I told her I was going to go fishing up by the dam. That's a long trip by boat, and it would explain later why I was gone so long. She told me she was going to go pick herbs for her magic out in the backyard and along the edge of the woods back there. Sneaking hammer, nails, and a saw out to the boat, I drove it on its trailer down to the end of our red dirt road and launched into the river. When I got to the barn, it was a beautiful morning, somewhere around 8 o'clock, I guess, and since it was spring, it was nice and cool. The early morning fog was burning off, and when I saw the barn, things looked hopeful. The fish had made a big hole in the side of the barn wall, but them boards could be put back up on the frame and nailed back. Inside, there was a big mess of busted lumber and mannequins thrown hither and yon, but from what I could see, it was really just a matter of doing about five hours' worth of repairs and get them poppets organized again the way they was before. When I pulled a section of wall up off the floor and got it leaned against one of the posts holding up the ceiling, I happened to notice that while... Most of the mannequins under it had come out just fine. The one nearest the barn doors, the one with my wife's name on it, it was busted. I mean, just shattered. Them female mannequins in the basement at Potts and Hemsworth all looked about the same. I figured sometime or other I'd go over to Huff City on my own and pull another one out, bring it back, and tag it. Linda Jean probably wouldn't know the difference. By noon, I had the back wall repaired and had dragged Linda Jean's broken poppet out into a deep patch of sumac and tall red top grass where she'd likely never see it again. I headed to the back wall to fix the hole the walking fish had busted through there. That's when I remembered the wedding couple, the poppets dressed up for marriage, bagged up together. They were just gone. I jumped through the hole just like I had the other night and walked down to the lake shore to see if they'd been pulled there. And while I saw the deep groove that was made by the fish's dragon body, there wasn't nothing else on the shore there but a tore piece of plastic. 
the wedding couple was just gone. That would be harder to explain. Meanwhile, I studied on how I would explain away how the bride and groom had disappeared. And while I did that, I went ahead and fixed the back wall. Got done with everything about four o'clock that afternoon and decided to head on back home for a shower and supper. When I went inside the house, it was real quiet. Usually Linda Jean would have the TV on even if she'd gone outside to hang laundry or fill the bird feeders. That didn't seem right, things being so quiet. I called out her name a couple of times, but no answer. So now I go out the sliding door in the sitting room out into the back door calling out, Linda Jean, Linda Jean. Then I saw her. Sometime during the day, probably that morning, she'd gone out to the edge of the yard to pick vervain or horse mint. And along there somewhere, a tree had fallen, just cracked right near the root line and had fallen over into the yard. And she'd been under it, pulling through the weeds for stuff she wanted to pick. She probably never knew what hit her, but hit her it did. That tree was a big hackberry. It just fell over on top of her and crushed her, crushed her back and her skull, and she was dead just like that. Well, I, I called 911 and they come with an ambulance and the sheriff and they was questions asked and they tried to help me through the shock a little bit. God bless them, those EMTs and them deputies. They was real nice and real helpful. Made sure I knew what to do and even called my sister over in Apache Mounds to come out and stay with me that night. I wish I could say the end after that part of the story, but there's more. My sister helped me arrange a funeral for Linda Jean, and she went with me to see her mama over in Huff City. Oh, it was a sad and pitiful thing, talking to her in the old folks' home and trying to explain how her daughter was dead. When I come back home that night, I was alone, and that's when I started drinking. Drinking and watching Fox News, watching Fox News and drinking. That's all I do now, plus some laundry. I like clean underwear. <laughs> but that ain't the end of the story. One night, I'm watching the local news. One of them stations out of Nacogdoches, and I hear about how this newly married couple had been found. I hadn't known these folks had been lost, but apparently they disappeared about four days earlier, and by now, EcuSearch was out looking for them, and they found them, too. Hadn't been married four weeks, this couple, and there'd been an accident with the car. They'd driven off the farm to Market Road that crossed over the dam, only for some reason no one can figure out. They crashed through the guardrail and rolled right down into the deep water there. They sat under the water in that car, side by side, for about four days. Must have rolled off that dam the same night that fish dragged the two poppets off into the water. Well, by now, I had figured out something. Linda Jean's poppets had been messed with by that fish, and one had been crushed and the others had been dragged out deep into the lake. And the fish had done all this because of me being curious and getting its attention and then leading it right into the barn with all those mannequins. There's no doubt in my mind that if I had left that fish alone, those poppets would still be where they're supposed to be, and my wife and those folks that got drowned would all still be alive. The fact is, 
I killed them all. I done it by sticking my nose into things folks should better leave alone. And that's why I drank like I do. End of story. I didn't know what to say after a story like that, so I didn't say nothing. I just sat there with Gil like you do sometimes with someone when they're sad. Some things you can't just put words on. Eventually, I went into the kitchen and mixed him one of those orange juice and vodka things he likes to drink when he's alone. He was grateful and patted my arm when I set it down on the end table next to him. You know, he said looking up at me after a while, whatever that fish is, it's been time and death for me, just like that bird in the poem. Now it's seen me, and I've seen it. You know what I'm saying? I reckon I did. Gil was now a marked man. It didn't surprise me at all when he said, Some night I'm going to go back there in my bass boat. I'm just going to cast my hook and spinner lure out in the water and see what happens. You know my sister's phone number. Would you call her for me when the time comes? We both knew what that meant. I nodded and left. I've been back there only one time since, but Gil wasn't there and neither was his boat. After I called his sister, I fed the cats and headed home. Ain't been out that way since. This is Damon Vulture. If you enjoyed this strange tale of the Texas Piney Woods, you will be pleased to hear Mr. Imo will be dropping more of his rustic tales here on this channel. And now, good night and dark dreams.